praise the name of Jesus. Uh, I want to be grateful to God this afternoon. Uh, I want to be grateful to the Anne family. Thank God that we completed our study for the reason for which we came. We've completed and we are going back to meet our family in Liberia. And I'm carrying the good news from Anef. I'm carrying the good news from Anef, they are what they have been doing in Liberia. Uh, have the name of Liberia on the envelope of uh, raising some funds to support an orphanage home in Liberia. I'm going to visit that church to say the, what you, you, we all have done to support Liberia. And I'm going to miss this family. I hope I can come back to China and come back to Beijing, be part of ANEF. As I'm leaving ANEF today, uh, I'm not leaving for, forever. ANEF is in my heart. ANEF is in my blood. I'm going to remember this church. Uh, before I came to, to China, I was in church, but there are work that I have done in, in this church that I did not do when I was home. So I'm going back with that spirit to serve the Lord. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. We love you, brother. And you're always a member of NF. Amen. No matter where you are. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm grateful to the Almighty God for this day and being part of this great family. I'm leaving Beijing on Saturday and we'll be back hopefully in September to continue my schooling. Uh, praise the name of Jesus. Uh, it's been a blessing fellowship and worshiping you know, the church here. Uh, I've been able to grow spiritually. I've been strengthened in many ways. And I felt at home being in this church. Because I first started worshiping you know, BRCF. But, uh, I mean, this is not politics anyway. But uh, here I feel at home, all right? And that's what I kept coming. I will miss you guys, and I hope we can keep in touch. As Pastor, I've already opened the email, and some of us are still going to be on the WeChat so we can keep in touch, connecting with one another. I'm hoping to come back uh, sometime next year, but I'm not going to stay or I'm going by the way, to the Netherlands, by the grace of God. Amen. Right. So thank you all. We love you. And we're going to keep in touch and pray for one another. Thank you. We could connect with them on Facebook. Use the church WeChat. Ask them for their, their email address, and you can connect with them on Facebook. Everyone stretch your hand towards them. Amina, you can stand up here. Let's stretch your hand towards them, and let's just give them our, our blessing in the name of Jesus. Father God, we pray for them. We thank you, God, for each and every one of them, all of them unique and special in their own personality, calling and gifting. All of them, their presence has been a special blessing and benefit in this congregation and our community. And we love them, God. And I pray they would go back home, God, not Father God, not, not, not just not alone, but they would go with all of our love, all of our prayer, all of our concern, all of our deep heart, Father God faith for them, God, that you'll bless them, the surely blessing you will bless them, God, in the name of Jesus, that you would, Father God, that you bless them when they go in and bless them when they go out, that they be blessed in the city and blessed in the field, that, Father God, the word of God that was deposited in their life while in Beijing would be something that would keep them to carry on, Father God, that they'd overcome, God, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And, Father God, we bless them we pray father god you cover them you protect them we declare financially physically father god uh, you protect them provide for them father god cover them in the name of jesus we pray a hedge over them right now in the name of Jesus, and we declare no weapon formed against them shall prosper, that they'll go back home and have a good church community and good Christian friends, and they'll continue to learn the Word of God, and that which you began in here, Father God, I charge you to be faithful to perform it, God, even unto the end, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father God, we cover them. I declare no weapon formed against them shall prosper. I declare every temptation of the enemy that you would, Father God, lead them not into temptation, but deliver them from evil, Father God. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever over their lives. In the name of Jesus. Somebody shout amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give him a hug. 
Right? I had to change the word Rise of the Beast. It was War with the Saints. But I felt War with the Saints was a bit politically sensitive, and I didn't want to go to jail. So I changed the name Rise of the Beast. Hopefully they won't understand, <laughs> you know, or take it the wrong way. So I changed it to Rise of the Beast, subtitle is Rise of the Church. And the, the, last, excuse me, the last few weeks, God has been taking us through what the theological world calls eschatology. Theology, and I, have, I might need some help here today, guys, from, from the Greeks. Uh, theology, theo, is God. And ology means what? Ology is knowledge. Knowledge. And lo what? Logos. Okay. So cosmetology. Cosmetology is like makeup stuff, right? But the ology means the knowledge of. Knowledge and the speech. Okay, good. So there you go. Ology is the knowledge and the speech of, okay? Cosmetology. Theology. Whatever, there's all kinds of ologies now, right? Mixologists, all these kind of things now, right? That's what they call a DJ. When I was growing up, they were DJs. Now they're mixologists, amen? But theology is, theo is God, and ology is the study of God's knowledge. Eschatology is the theology concerning the final events of history or the ultimate destiny of humanity, so when dealing with the book of Revelation, we're dealing with apocalyptic part of the Bible. Now this is very different from the rest of the Bible. The Bible is designed to be clear and to be easily understood and plain in interpretation. It takes a theo excuse me, I've often heard my pastor says, it takes a theologian to misunderstand the Bible. Amen? You have to really study hard and be filled with a bunch of garbage to misunderstand the Bible. But when we take the word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, and we see a, we, we, we see a consistent message of God's love to mankind. I remember I was in Columbus, Ohio, and I used to like to pick on the devil for fun. And I remember I went to High Street, and we would go down there where all the bars and clubs were, and we'd go out there preaching and evangelizing. And I remember me and a friend of mine from... Uh, from Philadelphia, we prayed for some Indian people, and the guy had a cane and a bad leg, and he was instantly healed, and he was jumping up and down the street and praising God, and then we went to the Wiccan bookstore. If you don't know what Wiccan is, it's wicked. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's occultic uh, stuff, and I went there, and the owner, I was so privileged to meet the owner because the owner was the author of the Wiccan Bible. So I was like, praise the Lord, I'm happy to meet you. So we went inside there, and they had daggers and skulls and magic charms, and I went in there, shikalabasata, just laying hands on everything. I curse this in the name of Jesus. I cast every demon out of it. I'm praying over the place. And I go up to the, to the owner, and I start preaching to him. And he says, oh, I know the Bible. I know the Bible, this and that. He said, you can't tell me about the Bible. You know, I'm the author of the Wiccan Bible. And, da -da -da -da. and you know, do you know the Latin? I even know Latin. I studied Latin in college. And, and in the Latin, there's certain verses in the King James Version that, were, that don't translate properly in the Latin. I said, come on, brother. I said, yeah, there might be some translation errors, but no matter how you translate it, Latin, Greek, French, Italian, Chinese, the Bible is very clear that Jesus loves you, he died for your sins, he rose from the dead, and you need to repent. And every language is the same. And he said, oh, yeah, I guess you're right, you know. <laughs> Amen? So let's not get hung up over little interpretation things, amen? The Bible has a very consistent, obvious revelation. But with apocalyptic literature, the opposite seems to be the case. Instead of God revealing himself, he's actually concealing himself. And he expects us to seek him for understanding, amen? The word apocalypto, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, Ap oak al upto, is that right? Ap acalito, a poquito. Amen. <laughs> this is Spanish. Uh, apocalypto means to take off the cover. The book of Revelation, some people call it the book of apocalypse. It comes from the Greek word apocalypto, or whatever, right? It means to take off the cover, to reveal or to make known that which is unknown. 
So the question is, why would God conceal things? Well, this is actually a very lengthy answer, and I don't have time to, to go through all the different reasons why God would conceal things, amen? But we know that God has veiled, veiled many things. God knows everything, past, present, future, but he doesn't tell you everything, am I right? If God would have told Paul, you're going to be shipwrecked and snake bitten and they're going to stone you and they're going to reject you and laugh and mock at you, you're going to go to prison. If God would have gave him all the details, Paul would have said, okay, well, I quit right now. Amen? Paul, God gave him a general idea. You're going to suffer. You're going to go through some persecutions, but my grace is a fi-. God gave him just a general idea because we are not ready to understand everything. Amen? And when God sees that you're fit and you're ready to understand something, then God will begin to reveal it to you, amen? I heard one man of God saying that that actually there's so much more to reality and to the world and to the universe that there's, there's so much more that if we were to all get it right when we get saved, we'd lose our mind, That's why they call people with a PhD, not a player haters degree, but they call a PhD permanent head damage. Because they say that they studied so much that they're dumb now, amen? When you go to Jerusalem, when we were here, we had the night to honor Israel, they told us about something called Jerusalem syndrome. When people go to Jerusalem, there's such a connection with God, there's such an open heaven, that they said that people get this Jerusalem syndrome, and people start crying and hugging trees and, and start you know, prophesying, and they heard the voice of God. And people always go nuts, and he said that you could, when you're walking around Jerusalem, you could always see the tourists. Because they, they, they always have this Jerusalem syndrome. Because there's just so much of God there. And, and they're so in tune with the spirit and things from God. And so close to heaven that their mind is just, oh, that they're, they become fanatical. There are angels in this room today all around us. But to most of you here, they're veiled. You can't see them. Because if you could see them, we would not never be able to leave today by 2 o'clock. Amen? If you could see the angels right now, you, many of you would react in such auspicious ways, I would never even get a chance to preach the word to you today. Amen? An angel appeared in my dormitory when I was in Bible college. Uh, I was on the second floor, and Charlie Shant, my friend, was on the same floor on the other side of the hall. He was praying in tongues all day. An angel appeared in the dorms. Many of the people in the dorms saw it. Guess what happened? Classes were canceled all day. People were running around, speaking in tongues on the floor, crying. We were good for nothing all day long because a couple of guys saw an angel. Amen? So we're not ready to really begin to see and understand and and know and visually see everything happening. It would be too much for our our very simple carnal mind. Do you understand me? So God has to veil things and conceal things and allow us slowly to begin to see and perceive and to understand and to grow. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 2 says that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it is the honor of kings to search out a matter. How many know that you are kings? And you are priests of the Most High God. Amen. King Frank. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. The mystery of the church, of there being a Gentile church, that was veiled for ages until God revealed it to Paul. The mystery that Messiah would die. That was hid for ages. Everyone thought the Messiah, Jesus, would come and set up his kingdom. And the apostles thought he'd come and set up his kingdom. And when Jesus said, I'm going to die, Peter said, over my dead body, I'm not letting nobody kill you. We're going to set up the kingdom. That was a mystery that was veiled for ages. Even the angels of God were not privy to certain things that God was telling the prophets. The angels are also privy to certain things that are veiled to us and are veiled to the prophets. Like God said in Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the morning stars sang together, you don't know. Where were you? 
The angels know things and have seen things and experienced things far beyond your knowledge. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10, however, says this. The purpose is that through the church, somebody say through the church. That through the church, the complicated, many-sided wisdom of God in all its infinite variety and innumerable aspects might now be made known to the angelic rulers and authorities, the principalities and powers, in the heavenly sphere. Wow. The angels, the powers, the principalities in the heavenly realm will learn the many-folded wisdom of God through you. It's our calling and our challenge to understand the complicated, many-sided wisdom of God in all its infinite variety and innumerable aspects. People think, well, you know, okay, I see that, Pastor, you know, the complicated, infinite wisdom, the many-folded wisdom of God. What, what does all that have to do with me? What is the purpose of all this religious knowledge? I just need to pay my bills. I just need to get good grades at school. I just, I just need a new job. I just need me a man or, or a guy might say, I just need me a boo. Amen. That's what we say back in the 90s. I need me a boo. Amen. The reason they think like this is because they haven't repented yet. Repentance means to turn from your way of doing things and to trust God's way of doing things. You think that you're responsible for your own well-being. You pick who you want to date. You pick where you want to work. You put all your effort where you think is going to be most profitable for you. And that means you haven't yet repented. Because repentance means you cease from your own works and you begin to trust God leading and God's kingdom in your life. I remember I was going to get a job. I was applying for a job for $30,000 a year. 30,000 U.S. dollars a year. And I went and I went with my friend Rachel and Rick Jumpa. How many of you guys remember Rachel Jumpa? Does anybody remember Rachel? She came here to preach a few months ago. And her and Rick, we met in Chinatown. We went to get some fried rice and some chop suey. If you're not from America, probably you don't know what that is because they don't have that here in China. <laughs> so we went to get some fried rice. and No, well, they have fried rice here and some chop suey. And we're having Chinese food. And I said, Rick, Rachel, I got this wonderful job opportunity in Southern California. I could be a pastor there for 30000 a year. And Rick Jumpa told me, he said, do you want to go work a full year for $30,000? I said, yeah, yeah. He said, Joey, you can make $30,000 in one day. You can make that in one business deal. Why are you going to go work for a year for that? And he began to challenge my thinking. There's a world's way to do things, and there's a heavenly way to do things. Amen? Now, my friend Rick and Rachel Jumpa, they're rags to riches millionaires. If you don't know, I knew them in Bible college the, they had no money. They were so poor, the government shut the hot water off. And Rick Jumpa, he, I'm not supposed to tell anybody, but he went and got a, 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 a lock and a key and a hammer. He broke open the lock of the building and returned his heat back on. He just believed God, charged it to the blood, amen, because he had to wash his babies. They needed a hot bath, and he had no money. He didn't have no money for insurance. They would go, they would eat dinner with the, the dollar menu at Wendy's. Does anybody know Wendy's? Wendy's is a fast food chain. It's like McDonald's. And they have a dollar menu. One dollar, you get five chicken nuggets. Another dollar, you could get a small fry. They would go and get five chicken nuggets. And him and his wife and his uh, three kids would each have a nugget each. And that's what they would have for dinner. With lots of free ketchup and mustard and, you know... Really? Now, this is why we were in Bible college. Now he's a multimillionaire. He said, Joey, why are you going to go work for a whole year for $30,000 when I can show you how to make $30,000 in one day? Amen? If you want to do it your own way, go ahead. You want to pick your own mate, 
Go ahead. You want to get your own way to success and your own way to grace? Go ahead. But Jesus said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Amen? He said, Behold, the fowls of the air, they neither sow not, neither do they reap, neither do they gather into bars, but your heavenly Father provides for them. Doesn't he say that? He said, He says, Look at the lilies of the field. Why take you thought for what you're going to wear? Look at the lilies of the field. They, they neither toil not, neither do they spin. Yes, Solomon and all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He said, Take no thought for what you shall eat and what you shall drink and what you shall put on. For all these things do the Gentiles still seek he said but seek ye first the kingdom of God and my righteousness and everything else will be added unto you amen this is why we need to seek the manifold wisdom of God as we seek God he'll take care of all of our needs amen now this book of revealing Starts off with a message to the seven angels of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And I believe that there are at least two different dimensions being addressed here. There is the literal angel of the church and then there is the pastor of the church we know through basic bible study that these seven angels were seven pastors of the church the word angels actually means a messenger it's also a greek word angelos right angelo how do you, how do you? agilos it actually means messenger the pastors are messengers to the church i'm your messenger amen I'm your angel, hallelujah. The pastors are messengers to the church, and the church is the messenger to the world. Plural. Seen and unseen. And as sure as I stand here today as the angel of the Lord for all nations, and as Aneth stands to Beijing, as the church of Beijing is to China, as China is to Asia, and as Asia is to the world, I declare to you today that we are quickly transitioning into the beginning of the end times. Prophecies that have not yet manifested in the natural realm are about to take place one right after another, and you can follow them right through your newspaper. Since 1948, when Israel became a nation, the clock of that old dragon, the devil, has begun to click, and the devil has a migraine headache right now. This happened at the tale of the death of Satan's greatest occult leader, Aleister Crowley, a homosexual sorcerer and the author of volumes of occult literature and a summoner of beasts from the abyss. He called himself the great beast and the prophet of the New Age movement. This false beast Crowley met his doom in 1947 and God's response to this occult worldwide revival was the establishing of his eternal covenant by returning the Jewish seed back to their promised land. In the height of Crowley's leadership, Nazi Germany was killing Jews by the millions. I learned this is the greatest holocaust that Satan has been attacking the Jews since the very beginning. He's been killing babies and killing babies. And in Moses' time, he was killing the firstborns. In Jesus' time, he was killing the firstborns. But this has been the greatest genocide of Jewish people that Satan has ever released while Aleister Crowley was in the height of his ministry on, on the occult. And I learned recently that on one of the fronts of Germany's newfound territory, they were being defeated. I'm not sure if it was Russia or the U.S. and their coalition. I'm not sure. But the Nazi forces were caving in at a critical border. Right before their defeat, Hitler's generals came to him and they warned him, allocate troops from the crematories and send them to protect the border so we don't, we don't lose. But Hitler's response was not only to ignore their advice, but he ordered the soldiers to double the killing of Jews and kill as many Jews as possible. Because he knew they were about to lose and his goal was entire extinction of the Jewish race. The killing of God's chosen people enjoyed a higher priority than the self-defense of his own national security. 
Next, in 1967, when Israel captured Jerusalem, the world as we know it became another step closer to the end of the time of the Gentiles. Let me just tell you right now something. Those of you who don't know, the world will never end. Turn to your neighbor and say, the world will never end. Many people talk about the end of the world, but that's because they have a misunderstanding of God's word. Now, there are several words used for the word world in the Bible. One of them, and I, I probably need some more Greek help here, but one of them is oikomini. Ikomini. I was close. I, well, that's closer. <laughs> Ikomini, something like that which is a feminine particle, present passive, of oikio, which means to dwell in land that is the terrain specifically of the Roman Empire. Another, another word for that oikomini is, is a portion of the earth that's inhabited by the Greeks in distinction from the lands of the barbarians. So you see, certain places where the Bible says world is not talking about, as you would think, the planet, but it's meaning a, a specific area or system. Another word is cosmos. Cosmos meaning the orderly arrangement that is like a decoration. By implication, it's the social world order. So when God says there'll be a destruction of the world, the cosmos is speaking of a, the social world order. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all the definitions, but number one, I want you to know that the end of the world, as I'm telling you today and as God describes it in the Bible, is simply the end of Satan's secular rule over the earth and the establishment of God and his kingdom with the return of Christ with his church. Somebody say, that's me. And uh, say it like you believe it. That's me. I'm coming back with him. We heard last week that before the wrath of God is poured out, we're going to go up with him. We're going to have a buffet. Somebody say big pizza. And then we're coming down, amen, again, to inhabit the earth. The earth will not be destroyed. When the Bible says that the Antichrist will rule the world and no one will be able to buy or sell without a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, he's not speaking of the whole globe. He's speaking of a particular region. And you know, now we have like the European Union and the United Nations and now they have this new, new Trans-Pacific Partnership. There's political regions of the earth where there's one currency and they're trading between each other. But many countries will not go into this. Many countries will not accept this type of currency. Many countries will not accept this type of political alliance. And many countries will be allies with Israel. And when the Antichrist and the false prophet, this religious leader, attempt to evade Israel, there will be many saints in the earth and many will be beheaded but there'll be others who will be doing the works of God miracles signs and wonders preaching amen so we see that with the rise of the occult came the genocide of the Jewish people and we see God answer with the establishment of Israel all of these things were the beginning of the end of times which we are in right now then we see what in what Daniel chapter 12 verse 4 says he says Daniel shut up the words apocalypse conceal shut up the word seal the book up to the time of the end. So there's going to be an apocalypse, an uncovering, an unveiling in the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Occult revival, genocide of the Jewish people, an establishment of the nation of Israel, and that now an explosion of knowledge. In the past 100 years, there has been a literal explosion of the increase of knowledge. The invention of electricity, automobiles, planes, computers have all taken place in one generation. The Hebrew word for increase is rabaa, implies not only an addition of knowledge, but a multiplication of knowledge and increasing exponentially. There's so much of an exact prophecy that knowledge is presently doubling every 22 months. We have some charts up here, you see. I showed you last, the two weeks ago. We see how every two years, technical information is doubling, 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 doubling every two years. Daniel uses the words, time 
of the end. We see here YouTube went from 58,000 visitors a month to 70 million. 70 million from 58,000 to 70 million in 2007. The increase in the knowledge explosion has happened at the same time as the rebirth of Israel. I showed you last week that in Africa, internet usage has exploded 7,000% from 2000 to 2015. In 15 years, 7,000%. John Chambers, the chief executive tech giant of Cisco said, Take what happened to the internet in the 1990s, multiply it by 10, and that's what you're going to see, going to be seen by every single person in the world. Wow. We are in the time of the end. So now we see in the book of Revelation, the same beast from Daniel comes back. He returns again in Bible prophecy. Return of the beast. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 says this. And war broke out in the heavens. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. Now, if Satan was a little snake in the garden, how did he become a dragon in Revelations? Do you hear me? If he was a snake in the garden, who made him a dragon in Revelation? Who made him so big? We did, amen. People did. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. They did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Satan is a liar. Somebody say amen there. That's a good place to say amen. Satan is a liar. He's always speaking great and swelling words. You've seen those images of God and Satan fighting each other like face to face like they're equals or there's one of Satan and God arm wrestling and they're arm wrestling over the... Have you guys seen these on the, on the internet? Satan and God are arm wrestling. No, Jesus and Satan are arm wrestling over the earth and all these things. All these, all, all, that's all a lie from the devil. There is no yin and yang. There is no comparison between the great I am and that old Lucifer defeated angel. Can I get an amen? I should say it again. There is no comparison with the great I am and the devil. Amen. There's not a yin and a yang, these equal power, dark and good. There's no comparison. The only power Satan has is assumed power. He has no authority in this earth. He is limited to people yielding to him to accomplish anything. Revelation tells us that in the end times, he'll release demons, frogs from the abyss, and they'll go forth to the leaders of the world to seduce them to following his plan. But all they need to do is say, get thee behind me, Satan. The Lord rebuke you because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And some will do this. Yet some will go for it, for money, for power, for sexual perversion. They'll sell their souls to Satan. But this is a deception because there is no power like the Most High God. Amen? There is no lasting sexual satisfaction outside of the covenant of marriage. There is no money that could compare with the glory of the riches of the inheritance of the saints. Somebody say, devil, you ain't got nothing I want. Say it again. Devil, you ain't got nothing I want. About three weeks ago, I believe that I had a, a demonic visitation in my dream. Three weeks ago, I was in an open field and a crow came down. And the crow somehow communicated to me, I think it was like through telepathy or something, communicated to me, grab my feet and fly with me 
I'll give you all the money, all the women, all the, th- all the fame here in China. I'll raise you up. I'll make you famous. Just stop fighting me. And he was flying, argh, flying over me. Just grab on. He said, just grab on to me t- and go with me. And I said, well, no, no, devil. If you're promising to bless me, I can't wait to see what God's blessing's going to be like. Amen? If the devil offers you something, I can't wait to see what God has to offer because he's so much greater, so much more powerful, so much more benevolent, and the enemy is a liar. Amen? Enemy, Satan's like America. He's broke and he don't know it. <laughs> Amen? He's driving around on credit. You know, living in his houses with a, with a big mortgage loan. He don't own nothing, amen. Devil, you ain't got nothing I want. Hallelujah. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who has accused them before God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives even to the death. This is the secret to defeating Satan. He is an accuser. He originates temptation, then calls you a dog for going for the bait. He causes the problem, then offers you a solution. You want to overcome? You want to make it? Some of you here, you've been Christians for a a year, a few months, four years, ten years. You don't know if you're going to make it to the end. Well, let me tell you the secret to making it. The blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Now, let me teach you now. What does the word of your testimony mean? What does this mean? I used to think that meant like, oh, say, oh, well, in 1997, I got saved. Some missionaries came and shared the gospel with me. That's not what it's talking about here. Amen? Oh, Pastor Joey, pray with me when I was having coffee. He talked to me about Jesus, and I got saved. That's not your testimony, amen? Satan goes before the court of God to accuse you. He says, you nasty. You bogus. You perverted. You're a killer. You, you had an abortion. You're, you're a whoremonger. You're, you're a degenerate. Now you're called to give testimony on your behalf. And you begin to testify of the blood. Yes, I sinned. Yes, I lied. Yes, I cheated. Yes, I failed. Yes, I gave in. Yes, I covered it up. Yes, yes, I, 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 but I don't plead guilty. I plead the blood. Amen. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. You don't plead guilty. You plead the blood. Hallelujah. I'm not guilty. I plead the blood. Hallelujah. The blood is better than the fifth because the fifth means you have no defense. But the blood says, yes, he did it, but Jesus paid the price. Hallelujah. That's my testimony. When the enemy comes to attack you and say, you, are, you did this, you did that, you deserve hell, you shouldn't go to church, who are you to lift your hands? You say, I, yeah, I did that, but my case is the blood. I plead the blood. Because of the blood, I can get back up. I can continue on. I can keep worshiping, tithing, giving, evangelizing, laying hands on the sick, serving God because of the blood. I'm not going to be guilty. I'm not going to be condemned. I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to not be able to pray in faith because I, I did something wrong. But because of the blood of Jesus, I can approach the throne room of grace with full confidence. Amen. That's the secret to making it. This is why verse 12 says this. Therefore rejoice. Whenever you see therefore in the Bible, find out why it's there for. Because your testimony of the blood washing away your sin, therefore rejoice. Rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea 
For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because you know his time is short. But you who are inhabitants of heaven, you are not inhabitants of the earth. You are sojourners here. You're ambassadors here, but you're not citizens of earth. You're not inhabitants of earth. You are inhabitants of heaven. So he says, rejoice you who are inhabitants of heaven, who dwell in heavenly places. I submit to you that there are two kinds of people in this world. There are the saints and the ain'ts. Inhabitants of this passing world and inhabitants of the heavens. We are inhabitants of the heavens. If you're born again, you have access by the blood into his presence, and there is a place in the heavenlies for you to abide. If anyone desires, let him come up hither. God in this last hour is calling the church to come up. He's calling his saints to begin to engage the heavenly places of worship and prayer and manifest the kingdom here in signs and wonders. The time of Moses is back upon us now and people will begin to talk with God face to face like Moses did and they're going to begin to arise but not just one man like Moses, not just one prophet, but a generation of people will begin to talk to God in his presence face to face a church a people who are called by his name will begin to inhabit the cloud of his presence and begin to fellowship with God beholding his glory when we see the spread of evil and demonic powers released from the white house Released from around the world. It's not time to be depressed because it's not time to get down and defeated because these things must be, but it's time for us to ascend. It's time to come back down in power. Jesus went up to the mountain and he came down in the power of the spirit. And it's time for us to begin to ascend into his presence. You Today, Tina said in her home country, there's a church, they go up to the mountain to pray. Let me tell you, there's another mountain there's another city it's a heavenly Jerusalem there's a mountain called the mountain of prayer and as we ascend that mountain of prayer and we ascend into the presence of God we will descend in miracle working power let me tell you one last time you are on the winning side we know we're not losers behead us and God will raise up 10 more just like us crucify me and three days later God will raise me from the dead the blood of the saints is nothing but seedbed for revival Revelation 20 20 says this and we'll end right here then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit the abusos to Taurus and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he was cast into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Amen. You're on the winning side, and God is about to shut the devil up. He's been accusing you day and night. He's about to shut the devil up. Amen? But it's time for us to ascend that mountain, become people of the cloud. There's going to be a division coming now. There's going to be the saints and the ain'ts. There's going to be the false church, people that fill a pew and do whatever they want throughout the week. No time prayer, no time in the word, no spirituality, just religious Christians. And they're the same ones that say, oh, well, we should just, you know, let the devil do what he wants to do. We shouldn't judge people and, you know. But then there's another people that are the saints of the Most High God. They're going to possess and manifest the kingdom. Which one are you? Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I did it all in 38 minutes. Praise the Lord. I don't know if we'd have enough time. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you for your word today. I pray that it went forth. In the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God, I pray that the people of God here, I pray every one of them, God, give them something, everyone here, give them something, whether they came to, to just check us out, whether they're, 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 they're normal members or attendees, whether they're, they're serving you in their daily life or not, I pray that every one of them have received something from you, God, have received the grace and the love and the mercies of God in the name of Jesus. 
Father God, we just ask you today that you would help us to begin to ascend into the presence of God and dig into the word of God to understand the manifold wisdom of God and that we would declare it in the name of Jesus that we would begin to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and you would begin, Father God, to pour out your blessing, that you begin to supply all of our needs, that we be able to walk in the power and authority of God and the earth and its resources would give up their substance so we could establish your kingdom here in the earth. And Father God, we give you thanks and praise for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. We had to stop the recording at that point, but you might be listening right now and you say, Pastor Joey, I wanted to pray that prayer. If I was there, I would have prayed with you. I'd like to pray right now, as a matter of fact. I'd like to give my life to Jesus Christ. I would like to have God in my life, and I'd like to know Jesus as my Savior and my Lord and surrender my life to Him. You know, repentance means to turn away from your way of doing things and to turn to God's way. We've done things our own way. Like they used to say in Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, when I did the 12 steps, they said, your best decisions and your best ways of thinking and your best ways to handle life have gotten you to this situation. And now it's time to trust a higher power. Well, there is no higher power than the God of all the earth. His name is Jehovah. And he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And through him, you can turn from your way of doing things to his way. And his way is the right way because he made you. And he made you for a purpose. And he knows exactly what you need to pull out your potential to forgive you of your sins, deliver you from the things that keep you away from God in a sin and death cycle. And if you'd open up your heart to Him right now, together with me, God can begin a new work in your life. So just pray with me wherever you're at, whether you're driving your car, whether you're at home, uh, wherever you are, just, just pray with me and repeat after me. Say, Father, I come to you now in the name of Jesus. I ask you to forgive me, forgive me of my sins, wash me in the blood of Jesus. I believe that your son died for my sins, and on the third day he was raised from the dead. From this day forward I belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd like you to contact me, and we can send you some more resources and materials that can help you start this new life, because this is the first day of the rest of your life. Email me at joe at nationsabroad.com, or email the church at nfcontact at gmail.com. And we'd love to speak with you and just correspond with you and put you on the right path, maybe help you find some local churches there online or something, or maybe we know some pastors there that could follow up with you and help teach you the Word of God. Thank you for listening, and feel free to download the other podcast and just feed on the Word of God. Let's praise His name on the way out today, amen. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. 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 When Jesus says yes, nobody can say. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. I'm not worried about a thing. Cause I know you are guiding me Where you leave me, Lord, I will go I have no fear cause I know who's 